Hi, everybody. So I'm Susan Bond. As I said, and I'm here to talk to you about the realities of leadership. Um, so um, a little bit about me. Um, as, uh, as they said, I am a, an executive coach and a leadership consultant. And um, I'm a former uh, COO of Travis CI, if you don't know, in the developer tools space. Um, I've been in technology, I think it's probably like close to 15 years at this point. And so today I'm going to talk a lot about from my own experiences, um, being a leader um, in technology um, and other spaces. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, but first I want to kind of give you, go back a little bit and talk to you about sort of how we got, how I got here. And I often think about, um, you know, if you think about career paths, I think about people who, you know, you know, those people who knew what they wanted to do when they were young and they went forward and they had the straightforward career path. Uh, you know, they maybe were a junior engineer and then an intermediate and then a senior engineer. I was not one of those people. <laughs> then, you know, those people who have like the winding career path, you know, maybe they went through and they, um, you know, they started like, let's say in the hospitality industry and then they became a chef and then maybe they became an, a software engineer. Well, I didn't do either of those paths. I like to joke that I went straight to the steepest mountain and started bushwhacking my way up it. And so, you know, what that means is, you know, I never really intended to become a leader. So when I became, you know, when I got out of school, I have degrees in psychology and sociology and all those kinds of things. I never really ever thought about becoming a leader. I just kind of was figuring out how to make a living. And my first uh, role in, in leadership became completely by accident. I was a project manager and um, I started building tools. We had no tools. We had no project management tools. We had nothing. And so I started just doing building tools and then sharing them. And I quickly got promoted to senior project manager. And then I got about a few months later, I got promoted to the head of the department. And I had no idea. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I, and that was my first time I was in, in the role. And from there, I decided I really wanted to be a part of um, coaching. I had discovered coaching and I went to school for coaching and I kind of moved more into a path of people development. Um, I ended up becoming a director of career development. Again, sideways. I didn't go down a normal path. I entered the field kind of sideways. And then, you know, I went back and forth working for other people and working for myself. And at one point I found myself doing organizational strategy, doing some career maps work and working with a CEO. And one day they said to me, so what do you think? Would you like to be um, my COO? And I was like, me? Be a COO? You're talking to me? And they're like, yes, <laughs> you. So I, I thought about it and I thought, well, gosh, do I want to do that? And what does it mean to be a leader? And um, obviously I accepted the, uh, the opportunity. Um, and and took it on. And I took it on mostly because I really wanted to um, help build better work environments. My career is very much about how do we build great working environments for people? If we are at our work all of the time, 70% of the time, our waking hours, I don't know, whatever it is, a lot of time. Uh, I thought, well, how do we make better work environments? So I went to work for Travis CI um, as a COO and helping the company through their acquisition. And so, you know, after I left that role, um, I was pretty tired. You know, acquisitions are pretty intense and being a COO was pretty intense. And it was definitely different than what I expected. And I kind of was left, you know, you know, when you're panting, you're like, okay, I did that. Okay, what was, what was that? So I kind of sat back and spent a lot of time kind of reflecting on my experience and thinking about the challenges I had faced. And, and then, I, I wondered, did other people find leadership different than, you know, like I thought it was something, it was different than what I thought it was. And I wondered, did other people find that too? Did other people find it challenging in different ways? And so I started talking with um, leaders, mostly in technology. And over the last three years, I've talked to 
hundreds of leaders um, and coached, talked to, interviewed, and coached hundreds of leaders about their leadership experiences, and particularly about what the challenges were coming into leadership. Um, and before I go, you know, this is all based upon their experiences, my experience, but also what they also told me. So we're going to be talking through that tonight. But I also want to talk about what do I mean by leader, because I think we use the words like manager and leader in precisely, and we use them interchangeably. When I say leader, I don't, it might be a manager, but not all leaders are managers. So I'm also talking to you folks who are chief architects, those folks who are tech leads, Yes, engineering managers, managers, vice presidents, all those folks. But if you are in a role, I'm talking mostly about conferred leadership here, but also you don't necessarily have to be managing others. Just so we're clear about what I mean by leaders so when you listen in. So here's, um, so I wanna to talk to you about what leaders told me about their experiences of what was, what they expected and what leadership was really like. So when we come into leadership, we expect that we're going to get to focus on strategy, right? This, we, this is exciting for lots of us. We get to make roadmaps and plans and think about the business and the product and where are we heading? And for me, the organization and how do we build an organization that supports our business strategy? This is very exciting for most of us and part of why we might come into the role. The reality is, navigating a lot of humans. The planning, the strategy part actually takes up much less time than most of us think. And nav the navigating humans part is much more. Um, and, and that's true again, whether you are a manager or not. And so um, when we're navigating humans, it's also like we have a, a strategy and then we have to sell it. We have to get other people on board with that strategy. We have to take other people into account. So another expectation is we're going to have autonomy. And again, many of the leaders I talked to went into leadership for the exact same reason as me. Rather than looking for control or, you know, being power hungry, they also wanted to have an impact. That was the most, like when I asked people, that was the most common response why people went in. I want to give back. I want to have an impact and help create a great environment. So we want that autonomy in order to create that. Well, what we discover is there's a lot of shared decisions. We can't just make decisions on our own. We have to share because there's a lot of shared land and sometimes there's disputed land, right? Oh, who owns this? Do I own it? Do you own it? Oh, do we own it together? Um, and so our autonomy isn't necessarily, our autonomy is not quite as free or as much as we might have thought. Another expectation is we come in and we're gonna solve problems. Now, I don't know if you're like me, I'll admit it. I sat back and thought, oh, well, why don't they just do this? Leadership is easy. They, they can just make this decision. That's the easy decision, right? So I was absolutely Monday morning quarterbacking, making that. And I'm sure some of you have also done this where we think, well, we don't understand some of the decisions that leaders make and we think they don't always make sense. And we think, well, if you wanna solve this problem, you do this. Well, when you get into leadership, what you realize is complexity. You are dealing with much more complex systems, organizationally, people, uh, where there aren't always right decisions. Uh, and there are sometimes are okay decisions, bad decisions and worse decisions. Um, and you can't always solve all of the problems that you want to solve, or you solve some of them, but you still see the gaping hole over there. And that problem is still exists for a subset of people. So I think that's a really important thing to talk about because we have to set expectations with ourselves correctly, which is decision-making is not gonna be easy and solving problems isn't necessarily a straightforward task. So another expectation leaders had is that they're gonna have influence, right? We're gonna, we're gonna be able to influence things. This is true. Here's the reality. When we have influence, People see, people see us as authority figures. They see us as powerful. We have a lot of control and a lot of say. And that means that you know people will complain to us. They'll complain about our unpopular decisions. They're probably gonna gossip about us. They're not gonna think we're doing a great job. 
Um, people have literally yelled at me, uh, employees, not other leaders. Um, I've been yelled at. I've been told uh, I didn't care. I didn't, I was incompetent. And what that means is, you know, when someone's upset with you or they're just upset about something, that means we really need to hold on to our emotions because of that influence we have and the power we have. That means we have to manage our emotions, even when, and I, I don't know about you, but when somebody is raising their voice at me, it's really hard to not get defensive and to, to, to keep calm. So, you know, again, I mentioned this because it's something to think about if you want to be in leadership and, and further progress, the further you go into leadership, the more you need to manage those emotions. So another one is we think we're going to direct things, which is true, there is directing. However, the reality is there's actually a lot of hard conversations. Now, for those of you who are on a path, let's say, you know, again, you don't really, you're not managing, maybe you're doing a chief architect role or, or really senior IC leadership, you may not have to fire somebody, but anybody who does the leadership for very long, you have to fire people. And you know what? It's the worst day. Firing people, letting people go, laying people off is horrible. Um, there's also a lot of hard conversations and managing conflict, talking to people when let's say someone's performance, they're just not making it. You have to have conversations about how to help them and they're uncomfortable. Um, and hard conversations, let's say when somebody's really struggling and unfortunately their behavior is turning toxic and you know something's going on for them and maybe something at home, but their behavior has turned toxic and they're now affecting the team and you have to have a hard conversation. I mean, even as I talk about it right now, my heart just goes to my, the pit of my stomach. This is what we have to be prepared for. So if you don't like conflict, and you don't like having to talk about hard things, leadership might be a rougher ride for you. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's something you have to be aware of. And I think this surprised a lot of people, uh, you know, when they got into it. So I don't know if this is an expectation, but I think we get into leadership and what happens when we're in IC, we self-effort, what we did we pushed the code, we got this feature done, we fixed this bug. There's a lot of self-reliance and ability to do, like our effort, we can see those results. So here's the thing, my, my dad, my dad's a design engineer. He built prototypes at GM, which is I think why I'm in tech because I love technical folks. My dad always had the saying, which is your assets in excess become your liability. And that's how I think about this, because when we rely too much on self-effort as a leader, this is when leaders fail. And they talk to me about it all the time. It's a common topic. What we need to do instead is learn how to be a multiplier. We need to learn, and again, even if we're not managing, we need to learn how to build capacity in other people, uh, how to have, allow others to take on challenging assignments, to build systems, to pull us out of the action so that other people can learn and grow and we can multiply our efforts. This is a really big one that people um, can really struggle with when they become a leader. So I don't know if this was an expectation, but it's certainly different. When we go in our early parts of our career, where it's often career maps, right? There's a ladder, there's a, you know, you get reviews, you get one-on-ones with your leader. I hope you're doing, they get that all this, you're getting that all the time. As you go further and further into leadership, there's less formal development. Sometimes you might not have a career map or a career ladder. Some people don't even have role descriptions. Uh, and I mean, I'll tell you at the VP and C-suite level, C-suite level, uh, performance reviews uh, may not even ever happen. Like, good job, <laughs> you might get. And that means that you lose, you know, ex you have to, like, how do I set expectations? How do I know that I'm meeting expectations? Leaders say this to me. I've had two new leaders I've just started recently working with say that. I don't know what the expectations are. Am I meeting them? I don't know. Um, because it's not clear to me. And, and they have to figure out how to do that. They have to figure out how to do their own feedback loops. And then the last thing, listen, everybody talks about this. So I feel like we do know about leader loneliness, but I mention it because um, leader loneliness is still something that surprises people. 
over and over and over when I, um, on one of the surveys I did, people said, I did not understand how lonely leadership would be, just how incredibly lonely I might feel. And so I mentioned that because it, we know about it, but it still happens quite a bit. And you're human. So we need to make loneliness is not good for us. So um, it's just a reminder that the map is not the territory. What we've seen of other leaders and other managers gives us a glimpse, but we do not know all of that. You know, when we get into it, it's different. It's a totally new territory that we're entering. And so it's all that's not lost. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to round out my talk with a few of the suggestions on how to counter some of the, the, the reality and expectation gap, which came from 500 Days of Summer, if anyone knows that movie shamelessly stole that um, because I love that that movie and 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 just like talks to like the emotions that we feel. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we narrow that gap when we get into a leadership role. So the first thing is to notice that it's a transition that what we did before is not what we're doing now. Leadership is a is a role reset. It is completely different. What made you successful in the past? may or may not make you successful today. And in some cases might actually make you an impediment, right? If we think about the um, self-effort one, that's a real huge one uh, that people talk about, right? Oh, they're micromanaging their control. Maybe, I think there are also people who don't really understand now how to be a multiplier yet. So it's marking the territory and knowing that we're in a new land where we don't know what's happening and we don't know what we're doing. A great book for this is called Transitions by William Bridges. Um, it's an old book, but it's a classic and it talks about the three zones of endings and new beginnings, but in the middle is this neutral zone. And that's where we are as new leaders and we're confused and it's emotionally and mentally frustrating. So mark that transition. The next thing is become a student again. Put on student mindset, not just read books, but put on that student mindset and remind yourself again, I'm here to learn and grow in my new role. And of course, get a coach. And it's not just because I am a coach. I really, I know I'm, I'm not objective here, but I really know that coaching changes things. And I've been listening to some of my other coaches and they say, oh, the CEO has been different. They got a coach. <laughs> it really makes a difference. And coaches can help give us a neutral perspective, an outside perspective, and they can help us with figuring out how do we shape some of those, it's a great feedback loop for people. And then, you know, on the multiplier, really focus on where do I maybe jump in on self-effort and how can I step back and be more of a multiplier? How can I build other people's capability? Many times people do this again because they feel responsible, but it's thinking about and asking yourself questions like, do I need to do this? Who's the right person to do this? Even pausing a few minutes before you jump in and get in the code, who should do this? Am I the right person? If not, who else is it? Um, by the way, at the bottom, that yes, that is a Darth Vader um, um, uh, hot air balloon. I did not pick it for that reason, but when my husband and I noticed it, he's also a software developer, we loved this picture. So Darth Vader balloon, never knew. There's also a Yoda one. Um, so the, another thing I would say is Make sure that you are um, building out some sort of structure for those feedback loops. Again, you really wanna make sure you have robust feedback loops. Finding ways to talk to your people, asking other people, um, also listening. How do you listen? Because you are constantly getting feedback, but it probably looks very different than what you had, be what you were given before, the way that it was given to you more directly. Now it's gonna come in sideways. If I hear a lot of chatter about something, I'm like, okay, that's feedback. Or um, someone said, this has become a meme. There's a meme about me doing this. I'm like, well, there's some feedback for you there that maybe that's entrenched behavior and unconscious behavior you need to look at. So find structures and way to keep learning and growing and getting those feedback loops in. Um, one of those great things is taking time for yourself. I think a lot of you are probably in the West Coast, so this might be harder if you're in international businesses. But um, I like to say, take the first hour of your day to just listen, to slow down so that you can maybe reflect 
People have said, oh, I reflected. Ooh, that didn't come out the way I wanted. Or, oh, maybe I should have let that person do that task. So taking time for yourself is really important. So make sure you bring along some friends. There are some great um, Slack channels and some great communities. Um, I know, you know, if you think about Rands and Repose, some of you might know he's got a great community. Find other people that you can talk with who are going through the same thing so that you don't feel so lonely and so you can ask questions like, how do you handle that? What is that like? So make sure you bring along some friends. And above all else, enjoy the ride. I will tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was probably the most fulfilling thing I've ever done and the thing that I learned the most. And when I look back at my journey as a COO and all my leadership journeys, when the one thing I wish was I kind of enjoyed it more and soaked up the moment a little bit more. Um, so, um, thank you so much. I hope these were really helpful for you all. Um, and um, thank you so much for letting me be here.